Now they tell, they tell me the technology's all in place. Wow. Wait a second, it's asking me to log on to the pepper mill. <laughs> Web. Okay, a as you've heard, I served for three years as the science advisor to two secretaries of state. It's not a political appointment and to the director of the U.S. Agency for the International Development. Now, that was a tremendous privilege because these posts took me to many different countries and gave me a really broad overview of the problems facing our planet. By the end of my time at State, I was deeply concerned that we hadn't even begun to address the critical issues of food and water anywhere in the world. My objective since that time have been to identify sensible ways uh, toward increasing our ability to feed a still growing human population in the face of climate change and to contribute to their implementation. Now, the population pundits tell us that by mid-century, our numbers will be in the neighborhood of 10 billion. It's a very old graph. Probably all of you have seen it on the internet. But you know, it's not terribly inaccurate. The, the latest uh, UN estimates are, are not far from this. Can we feed that many people, even as the Earth grows warmer? Can we do it more sustainably with less ecological damage? And there's an urgency here that we in the wealthy countries tend to forget. Hungry people topple governments. The Arab Spring began with food riots. With fireworks in the Algerian capital, they are protesting over the rise in food prices and unemployment. We do not accept this government because we have been suffering for 10 years and 10 more years are coming and nothing will have changed. Anti-riot squads deployed in many Algerian cities as a simmering anger threatens massive protests in the oil and gas rich North African country. These people are very desperate. They say their only hope is migrating to Europe in a quest for better living conditions. The solution is let us go to Europe. Young people today either end up in prison or immigrate. The government is humiliating us. They're raising the price of sugar. We have to pay the rent, the electricity, water, sugar, and oil. We're all poor. The riots are a crucial test for the ailing president, Buta. We know how that came out. So can we feed 10 billion? And what will it take to, to make agriculture sustainable? Those are easy words to say and hard things to do. So here are the tasks that confront us in this century. Making agriculture more sustainable means reducing its ecological impact. That means its pollution of air, land, and water. Today, some 70 to 80 percent of fresh water is used for farming. In the future, we'll need to reduce that demand because there are many competing demands for water. We need to adapt our staple crops to a hotter, drier world in many populous places. And oh, just by the way, we need to double the food supply over the next couple of decades. How do we get there? Well, it's actually pretty obvious, even if it's complicated. We need modern science and modern technology. We need to redesign agriculture as an integrated system of land, water, nutrients, and energy. We need to apply much more sophisticated thinking and planning to the sustainable use of land, invent better irrigation fertilization techniques, manage and recycle nutrients on a much larger scale. We need to farm in cities on rooftops for cooling and heat management and to decrease transportation costs for fresh, fresh produce that's largely water. And 
we need to think out of the box. New technology, new crops, new land, new water sources that we don't now think of as suitable for agriculture. Well, I'll take this one at a time. And the good news is that over the past half century, we've developed the knowledge and the technical toolkit to tackle these daunting challenges to expanding food production in the face of a shifting climate and a growing population. The late 20th century witnessed a genetic revolution with the invention of recombinant DNA technology, the explosion of genome sequencing, and the development of techniques for the reintroduction of individual genes into plants and animals. I wish I had time to tell you about all the neat things that were invented, but I don't. Today, nonetheless, it's possible to use these techniques to modify crop plants and domestic animals very precisely through adding, removing, or modifying genes to improve their productivity. One of the most familiar examples is the introduction of a bacterial toxin gene from the soil bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis into a variety of plants. Here's, the, here's an example of a, a corn plant. On the left, you see the damage that the European corn borer does to, to corn. And on the right, you see an ear of Bt maize, perfectly undamaged. <clears throat> now, what you need to know is today, only crops altered by molecular genetic modifications are known as GMOs, as if none of the domestication and plant breeding that preceded it modified genes. But of course it did. Now fortunately, molecular modification, that is GM technology, isn't dangerous in spite of everything that you read. The European Union alone has invested more than 300 million euros in research on the biosafety of GMOs. As you can see in this quotation from their recent overview of this research, and I quote, the main conclusion to be drawn from the efforts of more than 130 research projects covering a period of more than 25 years of research and involving more than 500 independent research groups is that biotechnology, and in particular GMOs, are not, per se, more risky than conventional plant breeding technology. And I will further say that every credible scientific body that has examined the evidence has come to the same conclusion. Now, the good news is that crop acreage has increased rapidly worldwide, driven primarily by cotton, corn, canola, and soybeans. Um, in 2011, GM crops were grown in 29 countries on 160 million hectares. Now, perhaps the most important point is that 90%, 90% of the almost 17 million farmers growing biotech crops are smallholder, resource-poor farmers. Half of the biotech crop acreage today is in developing countries. And the simple reasons that farmers migrate to GM crops is that their yields increase, somewhere between 5 and 25 percent, and their costs decrease, in some cases by as much as 50 percent. Now, urban myths about the dire health and environmental effects of GMOs multiply much faster than the crops. But not one has stood up to serious scientific scrutiny. All of the effects so far, both expected and unexpected, have been benign. Less pesticide use, less herbicide, fewer cases of pesticide poisoningly, and surprisingly much less contamination of corn, in particular with poisonous fungal toxins made by the fungi that follow the insects that bore into the plant. No uh, insect holes, no fungi no mycotoxins. But the rather widespread public rejection, fueled by advocacy organizations like Greenpeace, has had a huge effect, promoting the dev development of ever more complex regulatory requirements. The impact of the regulations has effect if, ha have had the result of effectively preventing the introduction of crops 
that would bef benefit the consumer. And of course, the big biotech companies are, are blamed for that. After all these years, and it's been decades, and given all the promise of molecular method, we still have virtually no GM crops other than corn, cotton, canola, and soybean. Some tiny exceptions. These are all either non-food crops or primarily animal feed crops, and all of them were developed by big biotech companies. Very simply because they're the only ones that can afford the 35 million or more dollars it costs to bring just one event, as they call it, to market. Now, this is way out of proportion to the market value of specialty crops, um, such as fruits and vegetables. And it's way beyond the means of either public sector scientists or small companies. Even the long-awaited golden rice is not yet available to farmers. It cont continues to be trapped in what I call regulatory purgatory. Now, figuring out how to relax the regulatory stranglehold and achieve broader public acceptance of GMOs are very difficult problems. But they're social, political, and psychological problems. The science is quite clear. Now, a recent example is the development of potatoes resistant to Phytophthora infestans a fungus that causes late blight. Now, this is the disease that caused the Irish potato famine in the middle of the 19th century. It killed a million people and drove another million to emigrate. Now, late blight affects potatoes all over the world, causing millions of dollars of damage to the crop. Um, using their growing understanding of plant disease resistance genes, Professor Jonathan Jones, whose picture is shown here, and his colleagues were able to identify, isolate, and transfer a good resistance gene from a wild potato that no one would ever eat to a variety that was uh, very popular for chips, creating one that was resistant to that terrible blight. Now, that's simply a remarkable achievement. The knowledge of the natural protective mechanism has made it possible to use genes instead of chemicals to protect potatoes. Right now, potatoes are repeatedly drenched with fungicide to control this terrible disease. Now, both farmers and consumers should be delighted, shouldn't they? But. Larry Piper potatoes, sharper potatoes, and many other potatoes, they want food. The debate over GM crops has been a political hot potato for years. Today, campaigners took their message directly to scientists, dumping a load of organic potatoes outside a laboratory in Norwich. They say the GM method is unsafe. What we know about the DNA of a plant is about 4%. So you're toying and experimenting with something and putting it out on a field scale and using us as guinea pigs. Here, they're 12 months into a three-year trial to produce a genetically modified variety of potato which will resist potato blight. The disease costs the farming world around three and a half billion pounds a year, but the argument against is that we simply don't know enough at this stage about the implications of introducing GM into our food chain. Scientists at the Sainsbury Laboratory say if the trial works, it could revolutionise farming. Farmers spray a lot of chemicals to control disease in the crops. Potato gets uh, 10 to 15 sprays a year to control potato late blight. And so I think that it's better if we protect the varieties we like with genes, uh, so we don't need to spray uh, with chemicals. GM crops have been highly controversial. In 1999, Lord Malchett was around almost 30 Greenpeace protesters who ruined a six-acre trial crop of GM maize at Link in Norfolk. High fences have been put up to protect the crops from being sprayed with herbicide. Today, there was a strong police presence, but the demonstration was peaceful. Scientists hope these plants could soon be the future of potato farming but there'll inevitably be some who think GM is an unknown science rather than a safe one. Serena Samdu, Anglia News, Norwich.
Now, this is really remarkable. I sh I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here to the efficient use of water. Um, but let me just end that. I, I gave it a little disproportionate time in my talk because uh, the hysteria seems to be gathering ever more severely. And the facts are so completely opposite to the very strongly held belief systems that many people have developed about GM crops that it's very distressing. And it's very difficult to reverse. Facts um, are very hard to sell in the face of belief systems that are based on fear and, are, and no knowledge at all. That's where we are today. If we can't use modern science, which we of course have used throughout for crop improvement, I think we will be severely handicapped in our efforts to keep up, to, to maintain the food supply in the face of a changing climate. Okay, so how do we make water uh, agriculture more water efficient? Now what I've shown here on this slide is the progression of innovation in irrigation technology from spray to low, to low energy precision application, which wastes a little bit less water, to drip irrigation, to what is now increasingly used um, subsurface irrigation. This is a, a technology whose time has come. It's used much more in lawns than it use, is used in agriculture. But here's a field that's irrigated this way. It's called fertigation when you combine the delivery of just the right amount of fertilizer with the right amount of water. Uh, what you can see here in the distance is a big tank that's actually supplying the nutrients that the plants knew, need when they need it and not all the time. This is both a technology that decreases water consumption and it's a technology that decreases pollution by uh, fertilizers. Okay, now here's an example of um, an extremely water efficient hydroponic lettuce production facility in uh, Quebec. Covers many acres, as you can see from the aerial photograph. Growing lettuce on floating styrofoam rafts in shallow water tanks year round, yielding some five times the amount per square meter as soil based seasonal agriculture can produce. Moreover, because the water tanks are completely covered, the only water lost is that due to evapotranspiration by the plants. The water is recycled and maintained in good condition for years. The facility is computer controlled and the water quality is constantly monitored. Virtually no yield chemicals are used for pest and pathogen control. Think of all the issues that that addresses. Now here are the, here's, here's just a little bit of, of view of how they process. Those are the rafts on which the, um, they have little canals which carry the, the um, rafts to con uh, on uh, like little conveyor belts. And um, then they are harvested, packed, and shipped. That's just one example. Here's another. This is one of the highest tech greenhouses, modern greenhouses in the world, located in Southern California. But it was built by the Dutch firm Kubo. Greenhouse is air conditioned from the bottom uh, by evaporative cooling through the distribution hoses underneath the plants. The tomatoes grow vertically on strings without soil. Insects are completely excluded by screens. And the yields are in the neighborhood of 100 kilograms of tomatoes per square meter per year. Now, um, Saudi Arabia still practices um, tomato growing in open fields and in um, just simple tunnels, uses a lot of pesticide, and the yields are on the order of three to four kilograms per square meter per year. This greenhouse produces almost 100 kilograms per square meter per year. Implications for water conservation, better use of land, better use of nutrients. Quite automated, you can see that they're very water conservative, and it's largely powered by uh, solar panels. Okay, now modern 
High-intensity agriculture focuses on the production of just one kind of crop at a time, be it hogs, cattle, corn, or soybeans on a very large scale. This has huge efficiencies and huge inefficiencies. What we do now is we use energy to pull nitrogen out of the air and extract other minerals from the ground to dump it on our fields, a significant fraction of which runs off to pollute water, as I've shown you. We feed the grain grown in this way to animals raised at very high densities, commonly enclosed structures. These animals generate a great deal of waste, rich in plant nutrients, which often then becomes a pollutant. I think many of you are familiar with these problems. Now, organic farming is a return to older farming approaches in which animals provide the fertilizer for plants. The principles of reintegrating nutrient flows is a sound one, but unfortunately, organic farming, as it is currently practiced under an arbitrary set of rules, is simply inefficient, which is why organic produce costs so much more than produce uh, grown by what have come to be called conventional modern farming methods. Indeed, the, the notion that we could feed a world of 7 billion people, much less 9 or 10, with organic agriculture is simply wishful thinking, no matter what you mean. Yet it's tremendously important to keep the principle of making better use of the nutrients in agricultural systems, um, even as we use the most up-to-date science we can find. So let me uh, share one example of such an integrated system. Let's see if I have it here. Ah, yes, aquaponics, which I'm going to see tomorrow, I think, a small aquaponic facility at Worcester School. Is that right? So basically, the idea is very simply that fish are grown. It's actually underneath the white curtains on the, in the, on the lower right um, to keep down the algal growth. And the water... The fish only use a fraction of the nutrients fed them, just as cattle use only a fraction of the nutrients. And the rest becomes an almost perfect, but not quite perfect, nutrient solution for pr plants. And that's what is feeding, um, that's what's feeding the lettuce beds, which is grown hydroponically like the one I showed you before. Now, the, the tank system at the lower right is basically full of, it's a trickle bed that has bacteria that convert the ammonia that's given off by the, uh, by the fish to, to more stable compounds that don't go off into the air. So this system is as old, it's thousands of years old. Think of, think of fish growing in the rice paddies. And yet bringing it up to modern technological sophistication is still remains a major uh, area for technological innovation. Now let me um, introduce you to the concept of urban agriculture, um, to one such trailblazing effort in Montreal, Canada. This is Lufa Farms. It's a 3,000 square meter greenhouse on top of an office building in Montreal, Canada. It's the biggest urban uh, farm in the world so far, and they're planning two more facilities in, uh, on their way. There's the website. Um, all of the, the Lufa Farm supplies baskets of these per picture perfect vegetables, which consumers increasingly demand, grown hydroponically with minimal water using biological rather than chemical control of pests, to discriminating urban consumers. Provides opportunities for high tech small scale businesses. I think you find some of this development here in Nevada. Tremendously important. And I think that one of the um, I think one of the things that, that I think is a, a very important aspect of both the hydroponic demonstration projects here and, and urban agriculture is bringing agriculture back to people. We are city dwellers today, and we've lost sight of what it takes to grow the food that we so take so for granted. Okay, sorry. We've just decided to flip ahead. <laughs> I've lost my cursor. Okay, 
found it again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so let me finally come to thinking outside of the box. Um, you'll read in many places today that we're essentially out of arable land. The amount of arable land in the world hasn't, what we think of as arable land hasn't changed in more than half a century. It's unlikely that we're going to grow our major grain crops under glass. It's just plain too expensive. They're not high enough value crops. Um, and we are increasingly relying on agri uh, uh, aquaculture to supply fish. This is a picture, an aerial picture of a huge uh, shrimp company that's just down the coast from me in Saudi Arabia. Each one of those little rectangles is a 10 hectare pond and they produce something like 20,000 tons of shrimp per year. But all of the waste from that farming goes back into the sea. How do we develop plants that we can farm that can contribute to the feed supply as well as the food supply um, using salt water? So that brings me to arguably the world's biggest long-term agriculture challenge, which is the supply of grains for both human food and animal fodder. Now one answer is, is to begin domesticating crops that actually evolved under the conditions, under the hotter and drier conditions that uh, we're expecting and that can tolerate salt. These are two examples of what are called halophytes. Those are plants that can tolerate uh, salt and grow in salt water. And although people have talked about it for decades, nobody's really domesticated them. And today we start in a very different place than we would have even 30 years ago. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're starting with salicornia, very simply because it's already in the food and feed supply. We've recently sequenced three species of salicornia and we're starting a breeding program. We need to do that with a lot of different crops because very simply, we can't count on our grain crops, on our current grain crops, which evolved and were selected by human beings in a much more benign climate to supply us in the future. Well, I hope I've succeeded in painting a hopeful picture. It is certainly my conviction that we can certainly even easily produce the food we need for 10 billion people and we can do it more sustainably. But the question I leave you with is will we? Now what makes me doubt that? Progress is very slow on climate change and improving water management is glacial. Governments have been underinvesting in agricultural research for decades. Half of us live in cities now. Most people don't even know where their food comes from except comes in trucks to stores. We continue to overregulate or completely uh, prevent the use of the most modern methods of crop improvement. And finally, primary agriculture is, is very difficult to fund. It's not considered a high target item for investment. Banking of any kind, although that's beginning to change. Now, none of these are scientific or technical problems. They're policy, regulatory, financial, and social problems. Will we solve them? I don't know. Thank you. And if someone will turn the lights on, and they just have, I'm going to come down because I really like to talk to people. And I'm sure that somebody's going to attack my assertions about GMOs. Do we tolerate a few questions? Um, I tell you what we'll do. We will tolerate a few questions, but let's just wrap this up. Okay. And then we'll do that. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we as scientists have to do 
is face uh, challenges that we receive not only in our own field but in societal. And I have to uh, give my uh, hats off to Dr. Fedorov for taking on one of the most amazing challenges facing the earth. When you think about 10 billion people and some of the challenges, we were just at a conference in China. 90% of Kuwait's food is imported. 90%. You want to take out a country, just stop the importation of the food. The kinds of things that you're offering will help solve that. So uh, if you'll give me just a minute to wrap this up, and then we'll have you right down here to have people. I'm sure they'll love to come up and ask questions. But let, let me uh, bring this to a, a quick closure here. So thank you very much. Let's all thank uh, Dr. Federoff for a wonderful presentation. As we come to uh, conclusion, and we're doing pretty good on time here, I have a, one exciting announcement. And we're going to be able to tell you who next year's Nevada medalist is. Uh, the nomination committee review, reviewed over 30 nominations. And out of that, we selected a Dr. Albert Lynn for the uh, 2004 medalist. Dr. Lynn is an uh, engineer material scientist at the University of California, San Diego. He is an emerging explorer of the National Geographic Society in the field of technology-enabled exploration. And you may have heard, and I don't know whether we have a picture of Dr. Lin or not, but you may have heard about him on NPR. He's the one trying to find Genghis Khan's tomb. So we're very proud to have him as our next medalist, and I look forward to seeing you all here next year. One final bit of uh, business, those plants and ornaments are yours for taking, so the sponsors can feel free to take those. I want to thank all of you for your support tonight and for all you do for the state of Nevada and DRI. Governor, thank you. Dr. Fedorov, an incredible challenge you're facing. Thank you for keeping our eyes open to what we have to do. Thank all of you. Have a pleasant evening. And uh, I would encourage you, if you have questions of Dr. Fedorov, please come up here.